Okay, let's go live. Okay. Broadcast. So hello to anyone who has joined already. I'm going to give it a couple of minutes before uh, I actually start kicking off the beginning of this webinar series that is hosted by Interlink, Interlink Back, and the affiliations that you can see at the bottom of the screen. Um, we'll just give it a, a few minutes, two, maybe three minutes to see if anybody uh, allow people to have a chance to join. Um, and then I'll welcome everybody to the program. A uh, couple of quick slides on that and how we're organizing everything. And um, then a, a short presentation from myself. And then I'll hand over to my co-conveners, Rafael Pereira and Daniel Oviedo. And uh, we'll complete with a moderated session at the end. So just bear with us for a couple of minutes while we wait for people to join. Um, the link. Just to let people know that this session will be recorded. Um, we will be putting it out on our YouTube channels later so that people who've been unable to join us in the live presentations will be able to access the presentations later on and we'll be regularly tweeting and using other forms of social media to put this out um, and I'll be giving you a link to the next uh, series of the seminar uh, at the end of my presentation. Okay so I think I'm going to take it from here in the interest of time. So this webinar on researching transport inequalities in global south cities um, was brought together very rapidly with the idea that inequalities may be worsening in the current pandemic problem with under the current pandemic problems and that it would be interesting to hear what people are doing uh, on an ongoing basis in this space but also um, uh, in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic. We've got some new guest speakers talking, we've got some regulars that we uh, have been in Interlink for a really long time uh, we've got some key recognized experts. We've got some new emerging stars joining us. So I hope you'll enjoy the webinar series and that you'll pass the message around. We've had a really good response already. So I think there are up to any amount of 400 people listening in, which would be wonderful. So quick overview, um, the general structure of all of the webinars will be the same. They will last an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, there will be three presenters with 15 minutes each. And then there'll be a 30-minute moderated session at the end. Um, in this case, I will be the moderator. Um, and you'll see going down the, uh, the, the, the list of various people that will be presenting and moderating the various sessions. So this first session is on access to opportunities. Uh, we're also going to be discussing issues of informality, uh, transitions to sustainable mobility, issues around health and mobility and transport, issues around gender 
And finally, thinking about issues to do with age, both young, old and disability. It's not an exhaustive list, but it is one of the things uh, that is, we have emerged from the research that we've done so far. Um, and so that's why we chose those subjects, because they seem to be um, widely engaging a large amount of researchers, policymakers and frontline NGOs. Uh, today's programme is the Access to Opportunities um, one. As I said, I'll be moderating. So I'll be doing the first 15 minute presentation, uh, followed by uh, Daniel Elviedo, who also runs our sister organization Interlink LAC, Latin American countries, and is from the Development Planning Unit at uh, University Bartlett College, University College London. Um, and then he will be followed by uh, Dr. Rafael Pera, who is working in uh, IPEA, the Institute for Applied Economics in Brazil, and he'll be talking about his access to opportunity project there. And as you'll see at the bottom there are the link, there's the link for the next webinar. Uh, you'll be able to access these slides online and so that link will be there and we'll also be uh, networking that round uh, to all our contacts as we have done to advertise this seminar. So just very quickly for those of you who are not uh, familiar with Interlink, which stands for the International Network for Transport and Accessibility in Low Income Communities. Um, the aims and objectives of the network when it was set up in 2007 was to try and bring together a range of uh, disciplines around transport, urban planning and the social sciences to support the development of more inclusive transport, particularly within the global south. Uh, we wanted to develop something that was allowing a collaboration not just between academic researchers but also a dialogue with policymakers, NGOs and also the funders of research. We wanted to uh, convene that around a series of workshop events of which we've already had a, a number and I'll be going through that but also we wanted to promote active and lasting collaborations uh, within the countries where we worked towards sustainable transport equity partnerships worldwide. Sorry for the lack of the E on the end of that. Um, and I think that this, uh, this webinar series is really part of that last aim is to keep the contact between us going and to keep the, the network live. The, the focus specifically uh, for Interlink is on low, and, low income and vulnerable populations, um, mostly because we feel that these are largely overlooked within the discourse on transport and um, urban planning in Global South cities. Um, and because we also think that this agenda that we have set around safe, reliable affordability, equal rights to mobility, reducing inequalities, um, and not just in terms of uh, mobility and access, but also in terms of protecting people from traffic related uh, risks, such as road deaths, pollution, and, and other um, problems from infrastructures, uh, unsustainable infrastructures within Global South cities. We also had an emerging um, agenda that realizes that sometimes climate change mitigation measures may unfairly disadvantage and worsen uh, transport disadvantage. And so we focus on that. And also very much in terms of thinking about building strong partnerships, issues around governance, institutional capacity, and developing skills um, and training programs. So that's our sort of broad agenda. Uh, we're very much focusing on uh, sustainable mobility solutions. We don't really wish to see um, more of the same. We won't, don't want uh, all, all low income people to have access to cars. We want to see, uh, hopefully, to promote more sustainable solutions and to help Global South cities not to make the same mistakes that we have done in the Global North in terms of uh, predominantly uh, promoting the car over other modes. And we're particularly interested in low impact modes and active travel, walking, cycling, use of public transport. Um, we very much see transport as an enabler of social development and well-being. Uh, this is uh, one of the slums that we visited in, um, in Lagos. And here we can see a young girl going to school, uh, accessing her neighbourhood through some self-constructed bridges uh, between the different neighbourhoods. We can see that, the, that through the picture that this is a you know, very dirty environment. But the little girl looks, uh, lo looks like she's quite happy to be go using these bridges to get herself around her local area. Whilst we're not necessarily saying that we need to promote um, slums, we nevertheless think that there are things, there is innovation going on in lots of places where you'd least expect it. And so we're very much interested in 
promoting a bottom-up agenda and working with communities themselves to promote solutions that they themselves identify. And putting that in the context of the sustainable development goals, not just for sustainable cities and for sustainable transport, but also for all sorts of things to do with promoting good health, reducing poverty, uh, promoting gender inequalities, and so, promoting gender equality and so forth. I won't go through all of this list, but in actual fact, you can quite often find that there's a sort of transport mobility access issue in almost all of them. Um, and in a longer presentation that I do, I, I bring out some of those issues. Um, we've got this research background that we sort of see that transport and accessibility and mobility are also facilitators of economic, environmental and social well-being. We're very much focusing on walking trips because 70% of all journeys in the Global South are on foot. But we do recognise that you can't walk everywhere and no, not everybody can walk. And uh, recognising that lack of access to adequate transport services and resources mean that people are often excluded from key life supporting activities. We also notice in many, many Global South cities, that the capital, that the investment that does go into new transport systems pretty much doesn't take any uh, notice of the needs of the poorer populations who are walking or even of accessibility and is increasingly promoting um, a more elite middle class uh, need, uh, uh, drive towards uh, picking up car ownership. Uh, and we see also on the reverse side that when you look at human uh, resettlement programs and so social welfare programs, they very uh, often don't take any attention to transport poverty. So that's a bit of the background for the research. We use uh, action research methodology, which is very much about co-production of knowledge, not only with our local academic partners and policy makers, but also with communities themselves. Uh, we really try to bring in a broad constituency of collaborators and very many multidisciplinary perspectives, because quite often uh, it's just as much of a health or environmental issue to put these things right uh, as it is a transport planning issue. We've undertaken a lot of desk-based studies. We've held a lot of stakeholder workshops, study trips, and various other things. Um, and we tried to produce a whole range of uh, research outputs, which are available on the website. I'll put that up later. In the interest of time, um, I can't really go through in all of those things. The network itself is actually very huge. We have already a 350 individual members plus growing all the time, many, many official partners, and very many people have uh, participated in our workshop, uh, workshops in various case study countries. I won't read all the way through all of this, but basically the picture is that the whole uh, issue is growing. We get case studies added all the time. And also our partners are constantly working all the time. Uh, Interlink is, as I say, a network. And so it's really important that, um, that we don't just see it as, as being within our possession, but actually seeing that these spin-off projects um, are, are acting independently quite often of the interlink activity. We've done a variety of case studies. Each case study focuses on a different specific group of needs. In the case of Ghana, we've looked at children and young people uh, in Bangladesh and Dhaka, particularly on the needs of working women in the garment factories. Um, in Nigeria, Lagos, we looked at some of the slum dwellers on the floating slum of Makoko. Uh, and we always do these study trips. Uh, in Kampala, we were particularly looking on governance and integration within the housing and urban planning program. Uh, Nairobi in Kenya, we walked, we did walking audits in Kabera, which is one of the slum uh, settlements. And in Cape Town, we brought in the city planners um, and talked about township mobility. Overarching findings, um, is that in fact low income and informal settlements are almost entirely absent for, and systematically ignored by city planners so that most of the time when you talk about sustainability and sustainable transport plans they don't apply to the informal and slum settlements. Walking as I said before is extremely important but not everyone can or should have to walk everywhere and there can be seriously socially exclusionary consequences uh, as a result of having to rely on unsafe um, and unsecure walking environments for all your tra transport and mobility needs. Real massive issues around safety, security and health exposures to pollutants, uh, particularly for certain groups, women, older people, uh, 
and in particular areas, of course, at night, but also around the, in, in the um, peripheral areas. Uh, walking provision, on the other hand, whilst walking is the most dominant mode, is either non-existent or badly maintained. And the new tra transport infrastructures really don't provide for sustainable transport. Uh, they often don't reach very far outside of the city centres. Affordability is a massive issue. We get the loss of informal transport in terms of when new, new um, projects come in, they ban certain types of systems which are relied on, uh, particularly by lower income people for their mobility needs. Also, where we see interventions, it's very often within the capital cities and second order cities, such as uh, the Cape Coast in Ghana, for example, um, are, are widely overlooked uh, and they don't have the same level of resource. So in summary, we have a growing evidence base that has come from our case studies, and I've just given you a real rough, rod, shod ride across them. But what we do lack almost uh, implicitly and explicitly across all of those areas is the guidance, the planning, the skills, the training, the institutional capacity in order to be able to make transport mobility and accessibility uh, in informal settlements. Uh, progress and uh, be sustainable and deliver on the sustainable development goals. So we have 10 key recommendations from our research into action um, and particularly uh, we have found this issue of establishing local partnerships extremely important. Uh, it's there and most, most uh, low-income settlements have had enough of people flying in and flying out and doing things without them. So we very much do action research and bottom-up research with the communities themselves. It's important to measure and audit so that you can produce the evidence base. Without it, you can't convince the policymakers, but you need to bring the policymakers and the agents for change in with you at the beginning because then they feel like it's their project and they will actually engage and, uh, and will, act, will be more likely to uh, deliver if they have a co-produced action agenda. Um, you have to be light and flexible on your feet to deliver the actions and grab the opportunities where they arise. We have a massive one now uh, arising from this COVID-19 uh, pandemic where we see that most uh, cars and public transport um, are not being able to be used and, and therefore people are walking and cycling more. Uh, we have to influence wherever we can, but also it's really important to evaluate the, uh, the outcomes, both social outcomes and distributional outcomes in terms of equity when we do things, because without that evidence base, we can't do more. So really that's it from me. I think I've just about managed my 15 minutes. Uh, here are some, um, some, some keys, the Interlink website, uh, and also Emma Sonovan, who is our uh, um, administrator, where you can get hold of us. Um, we're also fairly present on most social media. So that's it for me. Um, and what I would offer now, so we won't do any questions and answers at the moment. We'll have a, a questions and answers session at the end um, where uh, you will be able to raise questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. You can be typing into those all the time while we're speaking and then we'll have a session at the end. I'm sorry, I got muted. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to pass over now to Daniel Oviedo, who is going to talk uh, about his project in terms of uh, access and the T-SUM project. Thanks, Karen. Um, I'll share my screen now. Are you all seeing my screen? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you and, and thank you everyone that has joined us so far. Uh, we have been keeping an eye on the on the number of participants and right now we are over 180, so, so welcome everyone. Um, so, um, Daniel, as Karen said, I, I am a lecturer at the Development Planning Unit of UCL and I'm also leading uh, the the Latin American branch of Interlink, uh, Interlink LAC. Um, and what I, wanted, what I wanted to share today uh, was a couple of findings from a larger project that is called uh, Transition to Sustainable Urban Mobility, TISM, um, which is funded by, by the 
UK uh, research councils under the Global Challenges Research Fund. Um, and I'm going to focus on the case of, of Freetown in, in Sierra Leone. So uh, a quick um, a quick overview of, of the TSUM project um, is uh, a 2.5 years which aims to identify conditions under which we can identify pathways to sustainable and inclusive transport in land use. Um, and we're using two cities as case studies, um, Maputo, the capital of Mozambique, and Freetown, the capital of Sierra Leone. Uh, everything that I'm going to speak about today uh, builds on the findings of, of research that I'm co-authoring with uh, various colleagues that are mentioned on the slide from both University College London and the Sierra Leone Urban Research Center and the support of a colleague from the World Bank who is also a partner on TISM. Um, so as, as an introduction and as Karen was saying, what we're trying to do is to identify those trajectories that enable us to avoid the car-centred um, pathways of development that many cities in the global north have followed. There are other pathways that um, other more industrialized and developed cities have uh, followed that are less centered on the car. And our grounded hypothesis for the TISM project is that these blue dots that you see circled here are, are those cities in, in the global south that still at a lower point in their uptake of private motorization. And what we want is to accelerate that pathway towards that more green trajectory that you can see from other examples around the world. As Karen mentioned, Transport is essential, not just in terms of accessibility and, and the sustainable goal, and but also it intersects any other of the of the SDGs, and this is part of the of the work that we did as basis for TISM uh, of identifying the links between sustainable urban transport and the different SDGs. Um, and and since this presentation is focusing on access, um, we are trying to place these ideas of access and sustainable mobility in African cities by looking at three big aspects. The um, urban trajectory um, of the cities, which locates in the politics of transport and the kind of city that people want to see, the structural drivers and power relations that underline the systems of production, consumption, um, and, and distribution, um, and the urban practices both from the state and civil society. So in a nutshell, and in terms of accessibility, what we're trying to do is to try to find the transitions within these four quadrants of low private motorized vehicle dependency and high accessibility, both at the local scale and at the city um, scale. And for this, we are bringing forward an expanded developmental accessibility framework, which many of the attendees of this workshop have seen before at least in its earlier form, which was uh, proposed by Gers and Van V um, as early as 2004. And we have keep, kept those four main uh, dimensions of transport, components of transport accessibility, but expanding it on what it means in global South cities. So just a few examples are the, the room for maneuver, that informality, uh, both in terms of housing, transport, and um, employment bring into the whole accessibility issue, um, the, the different um, continuums of, of, of supply and demand that sometimes we see as, as binaries, um, issues of gender, issues of household composition, um, and of course the, the structural conditions of poverty and governance that are um, underpinning every decision making and, and urban development trajectory that we can explore. Um, so in terms of this particular research, uh, we build on a whole set of, of methods, um, multidisciplinary methods, some of which are qualitative. So we, we did a whole bunch in, in both our case cities um, of semi-structured interviews with different participants and stakeholders uh, related to transport and, and land use planning. Um, we also did focus groups in those four neighborhoods that I was showing earlier in, in my map. So we tried to capture different conditions, uh, trying to emulate those quadrants of, of um, different levels of private motorization, but also different perceivable accessibility to the rest of the city. Um, and for that, and, and with that, we started developing as well um, a whole set of accessibility metrics which are relying on open data, but also on the partnerships that we have created as part of the project. 
um, to, to collect different forms of data uh, from different institutions. Some are locally produced, some are open data, some have been um, developed for specific projects supported by international donors. Um, and, and one of the things that we found, and, and I want to use this, this photo to illustrate our next method, was that um, this is one of the depots for um, public buses in, in Freetown. And, and this um, sign on, on information on WhatsApp really caught my eye uh, when we were there. And, and it, it seems like WhatsApp has become, become a, a key tool for managing quality uh, and control of public transport services. And well, if that's the case, perhaps we can use WhatsApp for something else. So as, as another of our methods for accessibility analysis, we started mapping and analyzing unrooted semi-formal transport um, using many of the keywords that Karen mentioned earlier of co-production approaches, of um, use of um, citizen scientists to try to map out what were the main hubs of those unrooted uh, public transport services. Um, and here's just another uh, mention of the, of the specific focus groups that we did. So very quickly, what, what I want to show you is an incremental approach to trying to understand accessibility in Freetown based on all this information and the frameworks that I showed before. And, and the first one is, this is based on the, on the GTFS data that we got from the World Bank about the different routed modes of public transport in Freetown. We have the minibuses, we have shared taxis, and we also have those big buses that I showed earlier with the, with the WhatsApp link. And the first thing that we tried to find was what are those highly inaccessible areas by fixed route modes um, in Freetown, which are here dotted in red in different parts of the city. And these are the areas where, where we wanted to focus on, on what are the effects in terms of different accessibilities um, to, to key opportunities. Um, building on these and building on all the different types of data that I mentioned before, we started um, estimating accessibility metrics within the specific thresholds for time and different opportunities. So here I'm just going to give you a few examples. So the first thing that we did was we used also mobile data to estimate what were the main trip attractors in the city and we use thresholds every 15 minutes. So here you see the, the very low levels of accessibility that people have within 15 minutes of, of motorized transport using that data from the GTFS. Here is one sort of extreme or at least above average in African cities which is a uh, 60 minutes travel time and we still see many white areas where basically have no access to those opportunities within the threshold. Our latest threshold is 2.5 um, hours and even then there are some, some islands of disconnection if you want. We repeated the same analysis for other types of opportunities and we see how the structure of, of the, the land use and the distribution of facilities across the city makes a big difference in terms of different types of access um, for various um, stakeholders. Um, for schools, for primary and secondary schools, we see that accessibility, the local accessibility within 15 minutes is much better and that within 60 minutes we cover a, a good portion of the city as, as compared with um, productive opportunities using as proxy the main attractors. And then we looked at health opportunities, which in a context such as COVID becomes very important. And we see that this is very, it's, it's even worse than with the main attractors. So there is a very low coverage locally of accessibility to health facilities in Freetown, which doesn't necessarily improve much um, when we start considering um, an hour of threshold. Uh, and one of the main challenges that we have for this is precisely the topography and the disconnection of the infrastructure that enables operation of public transport. Um, and the response from, there, from, from Freetown, as in many other um, cities in the Global South, has been the semi-formal transport modes, which in, in this case are basically tricycles and mototaxis. Um, and as I mentioned before, we, we use this co-production approach to, to identify and to map out for the first time in Freetown's sto recent story history, um, what are the main hubs for informal transport um, and semi-routed transport um, in the city. And we have a very quick analysis of, of coverage. And what we can find is that within a thousand meters within the, the available networks or a distance, a measurable distance, 77% of the population in Freetown can access one of these hubs of operation of semi-formal transport, which of course is going to increase 
accessibility um, considerably. And then we did a quick analysis. We, we um, analyzed seven, um, uh, six uh, test stations to see how much were different trips costing between the six origins and destinations. And what we see is that in the center, um, the, the Okadas, the, the shared the share motorbikes um, and the tricycles tend to be less expensive as to say, for example, the, the more peripheral area. So we, we build these curves of affordability, trying to identify whether or not those islands of disconnection, physical disconnection from the routed transport also coincided with those where the unrouted transport was becoming more expensive and less accessible. And just to close, because Karen has been giving me signals for a while already, um, the last bit of, of evidence that we got is more from the qualitative side, um, which is from the focus group. So we selected one um, of those focus groups, and, and here I'm showing some of the main findings that we have under the different components of accessibility. Some highlights that are relevant is that the communities themselves can identify, um, are very conscious of who are those more vulnerable users, um, that there are a high le there is a high level of organization both in the unrouted public transport but also in the provision of infrastructure so in this particular case actually the expansion of the of the housing in in the neighborhood was a result of a community led initiative to provide a bridge um going over uh, um a small well yeah well a, a natural obstacle let's let's say um and that of course opened the the accessibility for higher income people that now have congested the, the uh, uh, already limited road infrastructure. And there are many other findings and these, these slides will be available for you later. But perhaps one of the things that I wanted to highlight from this process is that uh, we are trying not to let this research um, to stay as research. So as part of the TISUM project, and this is something that we can perhaps cover in another webinar from one of my colleagues, um, we have held different spaces for collective debate and uptake of the research and findings such as this one. And actually as part of the project in both our case studies, we have set up some steering committees which can actually um, take the research forward and, and translate it into policy. So very quickly to close, just a, a few conclusions. The first one is that that incremental approach to accessibility can let us see very quickly that inaccessibility leads to double marginalization on the one hand from exclusion from opportunities but also in relation to the inequalities in the in the use of road space and vulnerability um, that we need to keep doing this type of incremental planning and transitional actions to respond to the different scales of inaccessibility and that it needs to inform a detailed assessment of distributional issues um, the final message is that these collective deliberative spaces are essential in translating research into practice and that accessibility, even in context with poor information and sometimes uh, lower technical capacity, can still lead to very important um, insights for planning and decision making. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much, Daniel, and thank you for keeping to time. That's great. Um, I just want to repeat to anybody who is listening, participating, that the only way that we really can respond to your questions is if you go to the bottom of your screen to the Q&A box and type those questions in and we will then respond to them at the end of the discussion. We don't have an ability to respond to you through raising your hands or through the chat function and we will then um, try and answer your questions. Emma is uh, on chat and also on Q&A collecting your questions. So please use that function because it's the only one that we can manage in this particular large seminar format. Thanks very much. So without much uh, further ado, um, thanks for keeping to time, uh, Daniel. I'm going to introduce uh, Rafael Pera and he is going to talk about his project that is looking at access to opportunities in Brazil, in the Brazilian context. So over to you, Rafa. Uh, thank you, Karen, and thank you, Daniel. Can you guys hear me well? Okay, brilliant. Uh, so I'm very glad to be here today presenting this to you, even if it's just online. Very glad to see so many familiar names uh, in the attendees list as well. So I'll be talking today about the Access to Opportunities project. This is a project, uh, it's kind of a spin-off project from the research that I did in my PhD. And uh, the idea here is to 
uh, the, the, I'm leading the project at the Institute for Applied Economic Research, but I count with the support and collaboration from many, from, from a few other colleagues, especially Kawhi, Bernardo, and Vanessa. All of us are on Twitter, so if you like tweeting and procrastinate online, we're all there. Uh, just for the sake of context, the th uh, we are thinking about accessibility as the classical definition of, as the ease of reaching destinations. And it has been shown very widely in the literature that accessibility is a key factor that shapes human mobility. And because of that, it has uh, very fundamental consequences for the social, economic, environmental performance of cities. Uh, it also is a very important result or, of the combination of urban and transportation and land use policies, in which, which will have fundamental implications for social exclusion, satisfaction of basic needs, equity issues, and social inequalities. And unfortunately, however, despite the importance of such topic, accessibility is understudied and especially overlooked by policy and practice in the global south more generally, but especially in Brazil. In Brazil, uh, governments are still very much focused on tackling congestion and during pol uh, mobility policies instead of focusing on improving people's accessibility. So what we wanted to do with this uh, project is try to, uh, to create a new information and database that help us uh, shift the agenda from mobility to accessibility in Brazil. Uh, the Access to Opportunities project was launched uh, this year. We have the first analysis uh, uh, conducted for 2019. And the main purpose or aim of the project is to generate annual estimates of access to employment, health and education uh, opportunities by transport mode in all of the Brazil's uh, largest urban areas. We want to share the data openly, the code uh, will all, is also shared openly and create uh, interactive data visualization so we can have more uh, closer engagement with uh, policymakers and uh, wider community and academics. And finally, the ultimate outcome we want to achieve with the Access to Opportunities Project is really to inform policy planning and evaluation. And uh, in my presentation today, I will deliver some of the, uh, give an overview of the project, some of the preliminary results that we already have and what we're doing to achieve uh, those uh, aims. So the scope of the project, as I said, is focusing on employment, health and education opportunities, but we, uh, we might be uh, expanding the project in the next couple of years to include also access to other types of activities. Uh, right now at the, uh, for this year, we have calculated accessibility by walking, cycling and public transport. In the near future, we are planning to expand the project to include access by automobile. Uh, as I said, the project will run on a yearly basis, so we will run a batch of analysis every year, so we can have a long-term follow-up uh, of the accessibility conditions in different cities and how they change over time. And this will help us understand and use the data to perform, uh, to evaluate the impact of uh, specific policies, for example. Uh, for the 2019 analysis that we run, that was the first year of the project, we analyzed accessibility in the 20 largest cities of Brazil. So we calculated accessibility by active transport modes, walking and cycling for the, all the 20 largest cities. But for public transport uh, uh, mode, we could only analyze accessibility for the cities for which we had public transport data in GTFS, data, in GTFS format, which included only the, uh, the seven cities at the top, which are some of the largest, uh, seven, the seven largest cities in the country in general. Having access to this GTFS data is one of the most important uh, bottlenecks we have in the, in the project, and I can discuss uh, that a little bit later. Um, so we combine data from all sorts of uh, sources. Uh, we use administrative records to get data on employment, uh, health, and schools. Uh, GTFS data, we get them from municipalities. So we have, uh, we try to get direct contact with local uh, transportation authorities to get GTFS data straight from the source. And there is a, a back and forth process because every time we receive a GTFS data uh, feed, uh, this data usually has a few problems and we have to uh, treat the data and, and, and show to the local, go to the local government what problems the data have so it is a, a, there is a feedback loop. So we are trying to also, in a way, to help them improve the quality of their GTFS data simultaneously as well. We also use household, uh, household surveys with the population census. Uh, we use a satellite imagery from the Japanese Spatial Agency to get uh, topography or elevation, which is very important for 
uh, routing analysis of cycling and walking specifically. And we use uh, collaborative mapping data from OpenStreetMaps to get the public, uh, the street, uh, the road network. So how we combine all this to, to get where we are. So we divide cities into uh, hex, hexagons of uh, 350 meters approximately. We didn't want to get uh, hexagons that were too large, but computationally speaking, it would be very hard to get even small, smaller uh, scales. So basically what we want to do is to calculate travel time matrices from every hexagon to every other hexagon. It's basically like going, going on Google Maps and asking you to, to go from point A to point B. Google Maps will tell you the route that you take, the transport mode that you use, and the time it takes you. Uh, however, because we have a very fine spatial resolution for 20 cities, we have a lot of data. And we couldn't run this on, on Google. Uh, especially because for, specifically for uh, public transport, we have to run different travel time matrices every 15 minutes between peak and, be, and, and, and in peak and off peak time. So we have a better understanding of the spatial and temporal variation of the public transport network. To do that, we use OpenTrip Planner, Python and R, and all of them are open uh, source software and algorithms. And we, we have to query over 1.6 billion uh, pairs of origin destinations. We do this using parallel computing in about 28 hours, which is really amazing. And this would be absolutely impossible to do it with Google Maps unless we, you had a ton of money, and we don't. Uh, you can, you can as, as, as all of you know, you can measure accessibility in various ways. Uh, and there are tons of like hundreds of indicators to do that. Because this was the first year of the project, we wanted to start very slow and we calculated only two indicators. So we calculated the travel time that takes you to reach the closest opportunity to your home and cumulative opportunity metrics within uh, several or multiple travel time thresholds. Uh, let's say the number of jobs you can reach by cycling for 30 minutes or the number of schools that you can reach by public transport within uh, 45 or 60 minutes and so on and so forth. As I mentioned, uh, this was the first year of the project in the next editions we will be incorporating some more sophisticated uh, accessibility metrics as well. Uh, going very quickly into the results, uh, this is the map of Rio when you can see the uh, travel time to the closest uh, health facility. And we calculate uh, health facilities by low, medium, and high complexity level. I won't take too much time on these maps. Uh, this map shows you the proportion of jobs and schools you can reach in the city of Sao Paulo by public transport. And you can see how the public transport network really plays a very important role in redistributing uh, accessibility or access opportunities across the city. At, at, the, at the far east side of Sao Paulo, for example, you see a very dark region, what we call uh, uh, deserts of opportunities. And in the middle of that dark region, you see a very bright spot over there. That's a subway station. So this is the, 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 the beautiful thing about this, uh, this transportation accessibility modeling methods that we use is that we're not looking at only the spatial proximity to, uh, between people and, and opportunities, but also this, how the, the spatial and temporal connectivity of the, the transportation network really has an amazing effect on the, on, the, on the accessibility that people have. Uh, the most important thing, or one of the most important things we want to address in the project is really to talk about inequalities and in access opportunities. So we calculate, uh, let's say, the, 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 the travel time gap between poor and rich people to arrive to the closest schools. Uh, we calculate uh, the number of jobs that are accessible by different income deciles. So here on the, on the red uh, box plots, you see low income people. And on, uh, on the right hand side in blue colors, you see high income, key, high income people. And on all of these three cities who are roughly the same population size, you see a very steep inclination where the, the, the wealthier you are, the more income you have, the more accessibility you have in general or on average. There, there is a, a, an interesting in, uh, aspect of, of, of the variation in the data here, but we can discuss that later. We also calculate some uh, Palmer ratio. So here we divide the number of jobs that are accessible by rich people uh, divided by the number of jobs accessible by the poorest people. In this map, for example, uh, just walking for 30 minutes, the 10% richest people in Sao Paulo can access 9.5, uh, which means they, the, the number of jobs they can reach by walking in 30 minutes is 9.5 times greater than the number of jobs that are, is accessible by uh, lower income people. We do this for all the cities. 
the general findings for the 2019 report was that we find very large spatial inequalities. We also find very large social inequalities as well. So uh, in general, wealthy and white neighborhoods have systematically greater access than to, to any kind of opportunity than compared to poor and black groups, regardless of transport modes and regardless of city, right? Uh, I unfortunately, for in the sake of in the interest of time, I won't have to, I won't have time to go into all the details. I have to finish very soon. So this is the website where we where we uh, you can uh, visit. In the website, you can find the interactive results with all the maps, and you can zoom in and, and, and see, choose city, the combination of cities, indicators, and transport modes. You can find publications, all the data, and the codes that we use in the methods are there. Um, Here's the report that we published in Portuguese, but the, the, the paper in English is currently under review in, in the journal. For the next step, we will be expanding new urban areas, new accessibility metrics, transport modes, and other opportunity types. And most importantly, we, will, we are doing some international and international comparative studies uh, globally. And uh, we are also evaluating some policy impacts with partnership of, with governmental agencies. We are currently looking at a couple uh, housing programs in Brazil. Uh, this will, the, the whole project will involve some training at the federal government as well, and some other studies. Very quickly, Karen, um, uh, one of the most urgent things that we had to do, with, we could do to, with this project is to run a very uh, quick analysis of the COVID-19 uh, health crisis in Brazil. So for the 20 cities that we have in the country, we analyze how many vulnerable people uh, have poor access to uh, health, COVID healthcare services. This includes, uh, so for example, in the city of Rio, in, in the top map, you see vulnerable people who live further than 30 minutes by walking to any health clinic that would be able to triage or screen patients that are suspected cases. Uh, and in the top, uh, in, the, in the bottom part, you see a map of Rio where we, we map people who live further than five kilometers by vehicle to any hospital that could provide hospitalization service with the support of ICU beds and, and mechanical ventilators. And this is very important to emphasize here because under the, the, the crisis situation that we are facing, we don't have public transport uh, networks running uh, as usual. Uh, people who are suspected to be infected with COVID-19 are not recommended to use public transport. And uh, especially poor or low income people, they are very much dependent on the public health system in Brazil they are very much dependent on public transportation networks. They usually live in peripheral areas with very low access to job opportunities and health opportunities. And the idea with this report was to map and all the, all the vulnerable population with poor access and create actionable information. So local governments can know exactly what are the regions in their cities where they can engage uh, local health community uh, teams or pre-hospitalization uh, teams to uh, address this accessibility aspect. We, in addition to that, we also analyzed, oh, this is, was also analyzed for all of the cities. And finally, we also analyzed uh, the ratio between ICU beds per population. So we, we used some uh, three-step load catchment area analysis to calculate the availability, availability of health resources to population for at the city level, but also at the hospital level. Uh, I'm very sorry I had to speak very quickly. I, there's too much uh, content I wanted to uh, share with you, but I'm glad to have any questions and we can discuss uh, better now. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much, Rafael Rafa. Um, we've, uh, we've definitely uh, got a lot of questions coming in now on the Q&A. Um, I'm, I'm sort of going to kick it off a bit uh, from the outset. So. Uh, quite a few things to do with the practically how you did things and maybe you can have a look through those questions and uh, think about how you might respond individually to some of those sort of like targeted questions for your presentation. But one question just to sort of kick us off is that clearly um, in your case, Rafa, you have access to rather a lot of data, whereas in Daniel's case, perhaps access to a lot less data in terms of sort of for public transport and so forth. How much do you think that what you're doing is uh, replicable in sort of like countries where there's low access to data and, and how might you be able to get um, overcome some of that? And is there a sort of maybe a, 
link between what Daniel's doing and what you're doing. It seems like they're complementary, but not necessarily overlapping. Yeah, I think that's that's a very good question. I, I get this question uh, quite often, and this is one of the reasons we try to to put all of the data, all, all of the codes and methods that we use openly available on GitHub, so the data can become as reproducible as possible. The main the main uh, hurdle to this is really, as you said, data, data availability. For large cities in the world, OpenStreetMaps is, has a very good coverage. So we, we wouldn't have a problem with uh, a data gap in uh, street networks. GTFS data is a little bit more complicated. You might have it for uh, some cities, not for others. But this wouldn't stop you from doing accessibility analysis by walking and, and cycling, for example, because for, to do that, you only need the OpenStreetMap data. Uh, Population census data uh, at a relatively good spatial resolution is becoming more and more available across the world. There is the uh, pop, uh, there are a few projects, especially in African countries, uh, where you have very good uh, uh, data from uh, the guys at Southampton, the Population mm -hmm. Africa project as well. So you do have more information on social demographics. And the big challenge here, I think, is really the land use part, where you get information on the location of hospitals, the schools, and jobs. For jobs, there are a few people who have been trying to use Netlight uh, Netlight's uh, data imagery to has a proxy for economic activity. This might be a good proxy. Uh, I haven't used it myself, but I think this might be a good alternative. For health and schools facilities, I think that the, the initiative that you, that you guys use with community engagement and getting people to map their own communities might be, I think, the way forward with this, unless we have official data. Um, so, Daniel, Yes. Uh, in response to that, there was a question actually um, in the, the live stream from Ransford um, at Chempong, well, uh, uh, at Chempong, I think is his name. And he was saying that he found participatory accessibility mapping in Freetown interesting, but how can you scale it up um, from the individual perspective to sort of really do it for the whole of the city? Because it's obviously quite laborious. And how far is it? possible to go into one area and work with one group of people and then replicate that for the whole city. I think that is a challenge. Yeah, um, I, just to say very quickly in relation to your previous answer, there is, there is some overlap with, with Rafa's work. We also use GTFS and we also use lots of open data. So many of the sources that Rafa suggested, um, we have deployed in, in TSM and, and actually um, both in Maputo and in Freetown, it has been possible to work with this open data. And uh, there are many other, let's say, mid-sized cities in Africa where this is replicable. Now, in terms of the, of the participatory approach, one of the things that we found fascinating was precisely the, the um, level of engagement of communities, not just of, of high income, but also of, of, of middle and low income. Um, in trying to share data and to share their mobilities, we use a very simple technology, uh, which is WhatsApp, which is almost readily available for, for a majority of the population. It's surprising, even in African cities, um, that you have a, a whole group of engaged young people, especially, connected to technology that wants to understand better the city, that have a, a great spatial understanding of the city, and that are willing to contribute. And by by giving communities ownership of the data is possible to scale up but we have to admit that in contexts such as freetown where most of the of the technical and financial support comes from donors those um those partnerships are essential as well so on the one hand having an engaged community is a prerequisite but also having an engaged partner with local connections both at, at the government level but also with the donors is very important to scale it up I think also there's a related uh, question from Anjali Sharma, who says, um, if you use this bottom-up approach, how do you make sure that it isn't just the chosen few representing the community and that, you know, you get really good uh, spread of coverage for it? I think you've answered in a way that, you know, if, if you use some of these more like crowdsourcing technologies, it does actually allow more people to participate. So I guess that's... Um, you know, that's one of the, that's one way to do it. Yeah, one, um, one very short thing to add there is that oral processes were bottom up. So we, we did lots of, of engagement with gatekeepers, with community leaders, and we tried to broaden our scope. So actually the first 
uh, round of participants that we had for the WhatsApp exercise were people that had already participated in the focus groups and we tried to make a, a representative sample of the community as much as possible and I use big quotation marks here uh, but we tried to reflect different genders different occupations and different ages to try to avoid that um, elitism yeah good and also um to you Rafa I, I can't see the question now but somebody was also asking how do you manage to uh, think about informal jobs uh, because there's obviously you know you've got the formal economy but the informal economy is extremely important and that definitely wouldn't be available in a data layer. Yeah, so the informal economy is quite important in, in Global South in general and also in Brazil. And we, we would have data to, on informal jobs, spatial, spatial distribution from household travel surveys. Uh, I use that data in my, in, my, in my previous research in the city of Rio and one, there are two points there. One is we wouldn't have that for the entire country or for the most important or the largest cities in Brazil. So as yet, we don't know how that could be incorporated into the project. That's an important limitation. But the, my second point is when I look specifically at the city of Rio, what we found is that the spatial distribution of formal jobs and informal jobs that were captured in the household travel survey they are very much the same. So there is there is very high spatial correlation between these two types of formal jobs, meaning informal jobs tend to cluster where formal jobs are, which makes sense to some extent. So I assume that the overall result wouldn't be too much damaged by uh, not capturing formal jobs. And then actually, um, I can't read them all out, but there are quite a lot of questions around um, how you're using these analyses with policymakers, or if and how you're using these uh, analyses with policymakers, and how much you're really actually able to influence both the spending, uh, the development, uh, the, the investment in different systems as a result of what you're doing. I mean, both in terms of responding to this COVID-19 problem, where you are able maybe to produce very quick maps, like you're one to do with the the health and get it, you know, the access to health opportunities and get it out there. But also more generally, if you're able to really lever in, I guess, uh, sort of influential people to be able to make the changes. Daniel, do you want to go first? Uh, sure. I, I think, yeah, like taking, taking again that topic of, of partnerships has been key. And, and that's something that I also see coming from, from Rafa's presentation. And it's trying to reach not just at the technical level, but also um, in terms of representation and participation uh, to create these spaces for communities to also be aware of the information. And, and in that sense, presenting data and presenting findings in a more understandable manner is something key because part of the challenge is also trying to break those those silos and those expert-led circles that make transport so, sometimes such a, a closed issue for decision making. Um, and what we have done in TISUM partly is precisely to bring on board different partners, especially those on the side of the of the user rights, uh, looking at public transport and looking at the associations that are representing the informal uh, providers, uh, so they also have a voice and they can share the same space for deliberation with. Uh, higher level decision makers, including donors. And, and there's a question here for you, Rafa, from uh, Gregorio Costa Luz de Souza Lima, a uh, big long name, I don't know how to shorten it, uh, asking you what are the main challenges for implementing accessibility planning in Brazil? Because clearly that is not how it's being done at the moment. Uh, you know, where are the main barriers, really? So, to, I'll, I'll try to tie this question with the previous one. And I think that by far the most difficult part is really the mindset. We still have most uh, transportation planning in Brazil being done by old school transportation engineers who are very much focused on you know, traffic flow, tra uh, traffic modeling. And so for them, the, the metric of a successful of a public transport system is really about reducing congestion. And you measure the, the success of a subway line, a new subway line, but how you reduce congestion, which makes no sense. I mean, we have tons of research showing, uh, telling us about the, the black hole theory of highway investment and induced demand, and but that's still like st sticked to to the minds across the board in the country. 
that, that one say would, would be by far the largest challenge. The other one is really a, the, the data availability. As I said, GTFS data is available for a few cities and it's still not very much incorporated into the daily practice of transportation planners in local authorities. Uh, so accessibility is, although it has, it has been like in the academic literature for like decades, in the global south, it only started taking up like shape in the policy and practice realm over the past 10, 15 years, uh, maybe 20 years in the UK and in the US. Um, but uh, in the global south, this is an unheard of uh, phrase. When, we, when I talk about accessibility, when I, when I deliver this uh, presentation in, across other places in Brazil, I always have to, ex start, to start my presentation by explaining why ex what accessibility means and what's the difference between accessibility planning and mobility planning. That's a big difference. Yeah, because Jackie Klopp actually asked a question and also um, Jeroen Bastiansen is asking, you know, how we can use these accessibility indicators to inform transport decisions instead of cost benefit analysis and journey time savings values. Um, and it seems to me that, um, you know, we are still stuck with a paradigm where mobility is more important than access still. Uh, we haven't really um, changed the hearts and minds of the decision makers that when they invest in, uh, in, in interventions. And then someone else was talking about the fact that we might even, uh, we, we also don't consider, particularly in Global South, the last mile. So when we produce new infrastructures, we really don't, and it's not just the last mile often, it's often the last 10 miles uh, in the case of informal settlements. We're not planning for how people are going to get to the transport in the first place, let alone, you know, uptake the transport. So I think, um, so in, our, in answer to Jackie, do you, do you know of anywhere where they have started to adopt accessibility indicators in not the global north, but the global south context? Um, Rafa, go ahead. Daniel, maybe you first, and then like, right. talk about the African experience, maybe, and then the rough of the yeah, American yeah. One. So, so I, there are a few contexts, and I think, for example, that the World Bank has made a, a big effort of mapping accessibility in African cities, and to create an atlas of accessibility for supporting some of their decision making around funding. Um, I have to say that it looks very nice in the website, but it, it perhaps hasn't been a streamlined into the day-to-day -day operations. That's part of the problem. The, the other big challenge I have seen, especially in, in the African context and some parts of Latin America as well, is that cascading down, as Rafa was saying, of, of bringing the concept of accessibility, which it should be relatively straightforward to, to understand, but it, it keeps being, um, perhaps lost in the, again, in, in those expert led circles. So there, there is quite a lot of, of having more conceptual discussions and to bring that more to reality and to present it um, better. Um, the, the last thing that I wanted to say is that the, the accessibility that we've seen many decision making is, is more at that strategic or city level. And, and I think we're still forgetting a lot about that MISO or neighborhood level and the micro which has a lot to do with walkability and is a topic that is just taking off in many parts of the global south. Um, yeah, just, just a comment from the Colombian case, which I'm, I'm very familiar with. We have seen an increase in the uptake, especially in the latest development uh, reports and, and sort of plans for mobility uh, of, of accessibility metrics, especially since 2015 in various cities. So, yeah, Rafa, would yeah. you like to comment in terms of uh, in the, the sort of Brazilian or Latin American yeah, context? Yeah, I mean, from the Lat Latin American context, the World Bank and the IDB uh, have started to incorporate accessibility metrics in their uh, evaluation of transportation projects and, and for funding applications. That is uh, like a good start. Specifically in Brazil, the city of Recife uh, has started uh, planning, the, developing the city plan with an explicit concept of uh, accessibility embedded in, in it, which is like a fantastic initiative, but the person who was coordinating the plan just moved back to Japan. Uh, so we don't know how exactly this will follow. Uh, we have this like time inconsistencies, uh, it's like some policies are not sustained very much long time. And in the access to opportunities project, we have a formal agreement with the Ministry of, of Cities in Brazil 
so we are, we are starting to develop a couple of evaluations of two housing projects, uh, trying, trying to understand the, how the, the allocation of housing for low communities can affect accessibility for different activities. And we, are, uh, we will be training them and, and conducting four evaluation of, uh, of transportation projects, two accidental evaluations of projects that are still just on the paper, and two projects that they have already funded and have been already been implemented. And the ultimate goal here is that the Ministry of, of, of Health or the, gov the federal government in Brazil, who is the main uh, age funding agency, let's say, for local governments, uh, they have to, they, the idea is to lead them, lead them into incorporating accessibility evaluations into the selection of, of, of in, selection and prioritization of transportation projects. Yeah, I think we really need to win the hearts and minds of mm. the politicians as well. I mean, the city mayors as well as at the national level, because I know that a colleague of ours, who I know you also know, um, Alvaro Guzman, he's been working very well in Ecuador to really raise the whole issue of access and uh, active travel and walkability. And I know that he's had been able to influence quite heavily the sort of decisions of city mayors. And it does seem that we do need that level of engagement uh, and, and for them to feel brave uh, because they've got comparisons between cities. So um, there was a question here from Rathen King Jones Moloisani. Can I add something to that before you go into the next yeah, question? But let me just, uh, it's the same point, which okay. is about comparability. And I think that mm. this issue of maybe using comparability, um, you know, between cities. So he's asking, can I compare Cape Town with other cities? You know, and I think that mm. that actually could be a driver. So Daniel, yes, of course. Yeah, no, the, something that I wanted to say around your earlier point is that perhaps that change that we started to see um, at the, at higher level is also a result of the change in, in not just paradigms, but also the curriculums. So we, we have started teaching more about accessibility at, at different levels and in different right. institutions. And that has started permeating the practice today. And I think when we see chronologically the changes in, in planning and in decision making, it's also a result of that younger generation that is more aware of the concept and on the metrics that perhaps were just not taught before or not, or not as commonly. As, as we do now. Um, Rafa, I don't know, we want to take the, the, the comparison question. Yeah, so I think the, the most important thing to have in mind when we think about the compar comparative analysis is really to what extent the spatial resolution that we have, the methods that we use and the data sources that we have are actually comparable. So uh, in the case of Brazil, we are looking at 20 cities based all on the same data sets using the same methods. So the only uh, challenge here for compar comparability uh, sake is really the, uh, the indicator that you use. And the cumulative opportunity metric is not exactly comparable across cities because larger cities will necessarily have more jobs. And, uh, and there is a, a study by the International Transportation Forum and the European Commission that shows how cumulative opportunity metrics, they, are, they have a population bias in, embedded in them. So this is it's a bit uh, strange. But we are currently working on a project on a paper with uh, Hao Wu and, and David Levinson, where we are analyzing accessibility for over 120, uh, approximately 120 cities across the globe. Uh, this should be submitted. Was, we presented this at TRB this year and it should be submitted for publication sometime soon. There are various, various important challenges for comparability, but I think we have to try and, and be very open uh, about the limitations that we have in the data and methods. So I think that there's, I mean, in my mind, um, there's, there's two things. I mean, maybe what we could do is come up with more, uh, maybe a sort of more simplistic metric that it is possible for everybody to collect the data for um, in order to, to, to allow some sort of benchmarking. It may be that we don't necessarily want to compare Africa with Latin America, with Asia, because they're quite different contexts. And we know from our case studies that where we, we've had those different foci that actually, um, you know, there, there are lessons to be learned, but not necessarily always trying to follow the same trajectories. I think that would be true. Um, so I think that that might be a challenge for us in Interlink is how we might be able to come up with something that it, it enables people to discuss, because there's lots of things here, say, 
how do how does the inequality compare with other countries so mm. we quite often do that in other indexes don't we we talk about the human development index we talk about you know there's lots of these things so maybe we do need to find some way that is not heavily demanding of uh, of data or complex analysis where we could undertake some of those sort of like benchmarking comparisons and allow cities to think about themselves in comparison to cities like themselves, cities where they'd like to go, become, you know, or examples of where they'd like to go, um, and not just in terms of metrics, but also in terms of practice. But I think we're making progress in that direction. I mean, if you look at the literature, at least in relation to accessibility, more and more metrics of, of inequalities have been used and, and using, for example, Gini indices and Palma ratios have become more common in, in research and practice. And I think that's, that's a perfectly viable indicator to at least show comparisons between different cities in terms of levels of inequalities to access. Um, and, and as such, there, there must be other examples and other developments that are happening as we speak. Absolutely, yeah. And, yeah and definitely. On, that, on that note, Karen, just wanted to add that uh, the Access to Opportunities project is like we developed to, to the case of Brazil, but this is not a, a, a brand new idea. So David Levinson started a similar project with the university at the Minnesota University a while ago, and, and Andrew Owen is continuing the project there. Since Levinson moved to Australia, he's populating the world with the same kind of project. So he, they have, so we already have similar projects in the United States, uh, New Zealand and Australia, all led by or, or, or helped with the support of David Levinson. The guys at ITF, uh, the International Transportation Forum of the OECD and European Commission, have done a tremendous analysis for a lot of cities in, in Europe, like uh, over 100 cities in Europe. Yeah. Uh, Steve Farber, who is with us today, has done an amazing job in, in Canada as well. So there are different initiatives popping up about uh, using very similar methods uh, and similar approaches. And I think it's a matter of time so we can um, get this data together and start doing comparative analysis. Exactly. Crystal Venter has been doing some work as well in developing countries. And I think Crystal is with us today. You've lost a volume there, but yeah, Chris, Christo Venter does a lot of work yeah. in South Africa on accessibility as well. So, I mean, maybe there is a, a, a task there to do with a, some sort of synthesis that is less academically facing and a little bit more policy facing uh, uh, about these sort of indi indicators and not just how how to measure them but also how it, how to get there if you want to make a leap from one place to the other in terms of your uh, walking profiles or your uh, your sustainability uh, indices or whatever I think that um, I think that's a that's a really uh, a, a good point to start thinking about wrapping this up what I would say to both uh, Daniel and Raphael is that um, there are a whole load of very specific methodological questions that I've uh, not answered in the Q&As that you might want to go through yourselves and type, you have the opportunity to type an answer to the individuals that are there um, because they're very, very, I, I, I thought that they would be too methodologically um, complex, I think, to be able to sort of share them uh, in an open forum. So I, I've, I'll leave you to answer those questions. I'm hoping that they will still be there at the end of the session. Uh, we've answered about six of them and there are still about 36 open questions there. So uh, we, can, we can do that. Uh, we can even possibly share all the questions and answers that were given. Um, Emma, our, our administrator, um, has been sort of uh, monitoring this and we can probably quite quickly put something together which allows everybody to share all the questions and answers. Um, and hopefully in the next round um, of this set of session, we will be able to be maybe a bit more interactive and have like a hands up and people asking their own questions because that would be quite nice uh, for the moderator and for you guys as well. Is there one last point that you'd each like to raise and you literally have like one minute uh, till the end of the session to just sort of wrap up uh, your thoughts, conclusions about where you'd like to see this going in terms of access to opportunities. I'll let um, Daniel start with that. Um, yeah, thanks, Karen. I think the first highlight that I want to make is that we are in a momentous opportunity in a very favorable envir environment to work um, more on accessibility to opportunities. That's something that you can see from research, but also from interest of, of different parties, especially those that have the power 
and the money to make a difference. So, so I think it's, it's also part of and, and tapping on the objective of Interlink as a whole of creating these alliances and these partnerships and these linkages. Um, so we can also start seeing, which we're trying this in this in this webinar, new names coming up um, and working in these areas and finding um, results similar and, and more interesting results from other contexts. I think that's that's my message here. Yeah, great. There's there's a advantage in numbers, and, and Interlink will do its best to be that forum if it can. Rafa, any thoughts? Well, I think my I'm trying to be optimistic here. I think I'm I'm very glad with with how uh, the path that we're taking is shaping up, and we are very we are getting a very strong and close contact with uh, uh, the Association of Municipalities in Brazil and with the federal government. So we can incorporate this uh, type of accessibility analysis and data modeling into their uh, daily uh, practice and work. So I'm very happy that this is hap happening, even if it's just at a very gradual and slow pace. And I would be very glad to see how this data set is being incorporated and in, 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 in used by other researchers in Brazil, uh, especially grad students, and also across the board in other countries as well. So I'm very open to have international collaborations with people from abroad to do. See, Karen, I'm talking to yeah. you then. And <laughs> and so I'm glad, to, very glad to take in like new collaborations to do uh, research on equity, accessibility uh, with other countries and collaborators as well. That's wonderful. Thank you, Daniel. And I think that that is a part of the ethos of Interlink is that we like to see people collaborating and it doesn't necessarily have to be from the center out you can collaborate around the sides and every other periphery that you that you wish to engage with so i think from that point of view i'll, I'll thank both of the speakers thank everybody for participating um encourage you to sign up to the next one in two weeks time which is on informality um, focusing on both informality of urban settlements but also informality of transport um, and also the economy i guess Daniel will be moderating that session. We have uh, Nicholas Oviedo for the International Development Bank, Louis Alcorn um, from University of, oh, I can't remember, in America, and Jackie Klopp, so joining us to, as speakers. So I think that's gonna be a lively session. Um, you won't have to hear so much from me, you'll hear other voices in the room. Uh, so hopefully you'll join us then. And as I say, we'll, we'll, we'll share the link again with you through our various social media. So thank you all for joining and uh, we'd like to say goodbye to you now and stay safe. And apologies, we couldn't answer all the, all the questions in the Q&A, but we, we are happy to follow up on them later. Yeah. Just drop us an email and, or Twitter and oh. we'll be happy to address them. But there, are, there is an answer to this function here. So we ought to be able to type the answers to, to them in, in here, I think. Yes, uh, I think the, the recording, or we can put it as a text with the recording. Yeah. So I'm sh assuming that Alex has switched us off now. We're not live anymore. Is that right? It's still live, I think.